Let's open our Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 1. Now, I want to just encourage you. I'm going to make some statements here, and I'm going to encourage you just don't be quick to judge what I'm going to say in a negative way. You, you have to hear the message. You know, the Bible says a wise man utters all of his mind, but a wise man holds it until afterwards. A foolish man utters all of his mind. Not a wise man. A foolish man, unless he's full of wisdom, I guess. A foolish man utters all of his mind, but a wise man holds it until afterwards. And so hold your opinion until afterwards. The, the name of the sermon is this. <clears throat> Christmas, it is all about you. Christmas, it is all about you. I'm going to show you what we're talking about there. You say, well, but Pastor, Jesus is the reason for the season. Oh, there's no denying that. How many know the kingdom of God is like a diamond with very many different facets? I mean, no, there's a lot of different characteristics about our personality. I mean, even like God. You know, God, God is love, and yet it talks about the wrath and the anger and the judgment of God. And so Christmas, it is about Christ, but it is about you and I. Actually, that's why Christ came was for us. That's why he came. Jesus came because of you. He didn't come for himself. To be honest, God really does not need us in the sense of, I've got to have them. No, God created us for his pleasure and yet, I'm going to show you that God, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to make a statement here. God is obsessed with the human race. From the very beginning in Genesis, he said, let us make man in our likeness and our image. God sent his son to save us because we were lost. The thief came and stole us away from God. What did he steal away from God? Our hearts, our love, our devotion, our relationship, our walk. See, you need to understand this, that we were made to walk with God. That, that's why I was made. I was made to walk with God. I was made to know God. I was made to be one with God. Every one of us, every human being that has ever been born, and it says that God would have all men to come into the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and to be saved. You know, we, we sing Amazing Grace, I once was lost, but now I'm found. But if you look here in Matthew chapter 1, and it tells us how Mary was now uh, pregnant with Christ, and Joseph, who was a godly, righteous man, was going to put her away privately. For in other words, privately. He wasn't going to embarrass her, but he wasn't going to marry her, because in, especially in that culture, in that culture, uh, being a virgin was counted everything before marriage. And he was a godly man. And he thought he was going to marry a godly young girl. And she was. She was a godly young woman. And what's amazing, and it's a whole different message, even though the angel of the Lord had come to her and told her what was going to happen, and she said, let it be done to me according to thy word, she really didn't tell anybody what she was going through. People were misjudging her. Don't worry about people misjudging you as long as what they're saying about you is not true. Oh, if what they're saying about you is true, just go before God and repent. And, and, and here's another thing. I, I've said this before, but it's so important. You're not called of God to confess your sins to one another. You're called of God to confess your thoughts to spiritual people. And a thought is any part of your life in which you're weak. For instance, maybe... 
you've got a problem with anger. So you confess to a spiritual person who can pray for you and believe with you. Hey, pray for me, man. I just, I have a real problem with my, with anger. I need to be delivered. Don't ever go into details what you did with your anger. It says confess your sins to God. Now there are people who have a wicked heart and they want to know everything that's wrong with your life. Get away from them. Because a wicked man digs up the sins of another. We're not in the backyard of each other's life digging up bones that are buried. Amen? Aren't you glad? Amen. Matter of fact, we're called to bury the flesh and not dig it up. So we give that to God. But I want you to notice that uh, Joseph was concerned in verse 18 of chapter 1. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he, for he shall save his people from their sin. He shall save his people from their sin. Uh, we want to talk about that to a little bit of extent this morning because Christ didn't come to save us in our sin. He came to, came to save us from our sin. He came to deliver us from our sin. He came to rescue us from our sin because sin is like the web of a spider. That's what sin is. Sin is like the web of a spider that captures you or like the net that you catch fish in. It is what the enemy uses and what is sin, anything that is against the known will of God. And the enemy uses sin to destroy our lives, to rob us, to kill us, to take us captive. And Jesus came, Jesus came to save me, from my sin, from the law of sin that produces death. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from a law of sin and death. Jesus said he came to seek to save them which were lost in the darkness of their sin. In the darkness of their rebellion, their so disobedience. Uh, from the darkness of deception, Jesus came to pull me out of the pit of hell and to give me a place in heaven. He came to restore what the devil had stole from me. That's why Jesus came. He came because of you, me, and humanity. That's why Jesus came. He came for us. Say that, he came for me. He, he, he came, and matter of fact, remember his whole heart. Now this is not just the heart of Christ, this is the heart of the Father and the heart of the Holy Spirit. All of the triunity of God is in complete harmony with that purpose. He came to set me free. And whom the Son sets free is free indeed. In every, every aspect of the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, is a declaration of God's endeavor to set us free from the law of sin and death. Praise the Lord. He came to set me free. Now, some people like to focus on just certain aspects of sin. And I understand, and he did. How about you? He set me free from alcoholism. Praise the Lord, he set me free. He set me free, yes, he set me free. He set me free from uh, cancer-causing tobacco, smoking, chewing. He set me free from 
just wicked, foul language. He set me free from sexual perversion. Praise the Lord. You may not be happy about that, but I'm happy about that. You say, well, I never had a problem with smoking tobacco. Well, that's fine. It might be something else. You say, well, I'm not free yet. Hey, take great hope. That's why Jesus came to set you free. He came to set you free from fear and depression and anxiety and hate and bitterness. How do you know, Pastor Mike? Because none of those things are found in God. None of those things. Let thy will be done in heaven as it is on earth. Or let's say it this way, let thy will be done in my nature as it is in the nature of the Father, the Son, and Holy Ghost. His personality. See, he sent his Son to set us free. He gave us the greatest gift that he could ever give us. He gave us himself. What do you mean he gave us himself? Christ was the complete, total will of the Father in the flesh. That's what Jesus came to do. He came to set me free. Then you say, well, I'm not, I'm not, Pastor Mike, I'm not free to the point where I need to be free. Acknowledge. Matter of fact, Paul said, I have not yet apprehended that for which I've been apprehended. But this one thing I do, Forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press, say I press, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The high calling, the holy calling, the wonderful calling of what? To be like Enoch who walked with Christ, walked with God and was not. So I want to see less of Mike Yeager every day and more of Jesus. I want Christ to be manifested. Jesus came. Christmas is God coming for you. You couldn't get to him. So he said, I'm coming for you. He said, you're lost and you're undone. You don't know how to find your way home. But I'm coming for you. And he's coming again for his church. Jesus came to rescue me from that which separates me from him. And there was a price that had to be paid. The blood had to be shed. His life had to be given. So when Christ came, he was wrapped in swaddling clothes, which actually they say is the, clo the same cloth they used to wrap a dead man in. So Christ came to die that we could be reunited with the Father. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. See, this question whether or not God loves you was dealt with Christ on the cross. God's heart was manifested that day as Mary gave birth to that little child. God's heart wrapped in human flesh. Let's keep our finger here, but jump back there just for a moment to the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 6. I want you to notice how the Bible presents the birth of Christ. The birth of Christ. Now, I... Uh, my wife and I the other day were at Hoss's, and there was an couple, older couple there, and they had the sweetest little grandbaby, cute little girl. I just, and she was so happy. She was kicking her feet, and, you know, and was, wasn't she beautiful, Kathy, and a little jealous of them, you know. And, but just such a precious little child, precious, precious. I, I want you to see, in all honesty, as God looks upon Humanity, he knows their condition. He knows they're lost. He knows they're blind. He knows they've been taken captive by the devil. But he doesn't look upon humanity with disgust. Yes, sin must be dealt with. That's why Christ came. But he looks upon humanity with overwhelming love. And the cry of his heart is, I want to rescue you. 
I want to save you. I want to help you. I want to deliver you. I want to set you free from what? From that which destroys you. You know, as Christ reaches out to us by his word, by his spirit, by the, 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 the moving of the Holy Ghost, he, he is trying to rescue us. He is not like the Pharisees who are trying to kill a woman caught in adultery. He wants to rescue us. And Jesus wept. He spoke over Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that has slain the prophets. How many times I would have rescued you. He's weeping now. He's weeping. And he says, but you would not. Christ is at the door of the heart of every person. And he's knocking. And he's beckoning and he's calling like in the song of Solomon when the husband was crying out to his wife, open the door, open the door, my beloved. And she would not open the door. When she finally did, he was gone. He's reaching out and knocking on our lives. And he's saying, let me into your heart. Let me into your affairs. Let me into your mind. Let me into your emotions. Let me into your family. Let me into your marriage. Let me into your finances. Let me into every part. Jesus came to set us free. Honestly, this is what the declaration of Christmas really is all about. He came to set me free. The wonderful news is that there's an amazing promise in Ephesians. It says, now unto him that is able. Say, God is able. To do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. According to the power that's at work in us. What power is at work in us? Well, it's the truth. If you have it. It's the spirit. It's the father. And it's Christ Jesus, the hope of glory. He's at work in me. He's at work in you. Go ahead, and, and, and it may not be polite, but point your finger at your neighbor and say, He's at work in you. Tell them there's still hope for you. There's hope for me. See, he came, and you notice what it says here in the book of Isaiah chapter 9. In verse 6, now in verse 5, it says, For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise and garments rolled in blood, but this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. In the old covenant, God couldn't change the human heart. He couldn't make him a brand new person until the ultimate price was paid, till the Lamb of God had come and gave his self for our sins and our iniquities and our sins until he redeemed us and bought us with his blood from every kindred, every nation, every tongue. You may not know it, but we all have the same mother and father. I don't care about the color of your skin. I don't care about your heritage. I don't care about your background. It was Adam and Eve. We all come from the same DNA. And when everything's completed, we'll all be one family. Praise the Lord. And in Christ, we are one family. In Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, male or female, but we are all one in Christ. You know, that was a prayer that Jesus prayed, oh, Father, that they may be one even as we are one. Why? That the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. See, that's what Christ came to do. He came for us. To make us one with him. Wow. He wants us to be one with him. In his personality, in his attitude, in his character, in his nature, in his perspective, in his thoughts. If two be not agreed together, they can't walk together. That's why God gave you his word. You can be born again. You can even be baptized in the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues. But if you don't have the word of God in your heart, the Holy Ghost has, had, had, doesn't have what it needs to get the job done. It is almost like hiring a man to build your house. And you might have all of the building supplies, but you also have to supply the tools. The saw, the hammer, all the necessary parts, the nails, the measuring tape. 
And all of a sudden, you hire a man who's an expert carpenter, and he's going to build a house, and you got your lumber there, you got your ceiling tiles there, you got your drywall, you got your plumbing, you got your electric wiring, and you say, okay, go to work. And he says, well, I need the tools. You need to supply the tools. You go, what? Well, do something. No, you give me the tools. You know what the tool is? For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow. It is a discern of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now there is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. He sent his word and he healed them. His word in your heart. His word in your mind. Your mind renewed according to the scriptures. You only discover what Christ has done, who Christ is, and what he wants to do in his word. It's not based on your feelings. It's not based. Our society is so messed up that I read the other day about an, a, a, a man who had been married six years. I mean, for he had married many years. He had six kids. How many read this? It's terrible. Married for years, had six kids, and he just felt in his heart, I'm not a man, I'm a woman. But not only did he say he was a woman, but he said, I'm a six-year-old girl. And so he left his home and became a six-year-old girl, and the family adopted him. You say, there ain't no way, Pastor Michael. Oh, yes, it is. It's bizarre. It is absolutely just completely demonic. You know why? Because he has nothing to guide his life by. It's like having a boat with no rudder. It's like having a car with no steering wheel. Listen, if you as a believer, you don't know the word of God, you're just going by how you feel, how it looks, and what's a happening. But my Bible says the just shall live by faith. The just shall walk by faith. And what is faith? God, whatever your word says, I believe it. See, I, I've tried to live my life for over 40 years based upon what the Word of God says. How you treat your wife, how you treat your neighbor, how you, how you pray, how you talk, how you walk, how you act, how you think, what you say. Death and life is in the power of the tongue. If you don't have much of the Word of God in your heart, the Holy Ghost, the Father, and the Son, they're standing by, tears rolling down their faces saying, Oh, I wish I could do more for you, but I can't. Because it's the amount of words you believe. Let it be done to you according to your faith. And faith cometh by hearing one of the ways and hearing by the word of God. Are you getting something this morning? I'm telling you, notice what it says there in verse 5. Every battle in the, in the Old Testament was, was won by, by brutal, brutal means. But in the New Testament, in verse 6, for unto who? Unto us. Say, unto me. For unto me a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Who is the us? As many as received him. To them gave he power to become the sons of God. Even as many that believe on his name. Unto them as many as believe and as are baptized shall be saved. And them that believe not shall be damned. Oh, brothers and sisters, to the extent we believe on the son. And we're baptized. Baptism is symbolic of dying to self. Dying to your flesh. Because it goes against the grain. It goes against the word. It goes against the truth of God. Well, I believe this and I believe that. Well, what do you believe, Pastor Mike? I strive to believe this. I strive to believe whatever it says in context. According to the divine nature of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And so on to us, on to me, on to Mike Yeager. I didn't know this. He was born for me. He was born for you. He was born for all of humanity. The Bible says he's the Savior. He's the Savior of all men, especially of them that believe. For in other words, he, Christ came for all mankind. He came for everybody. But broad and wide is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in their end. But straight and narrow is the way that leads to life, and few there be which find it. Jesus, his personality, his character, who he is, is the straight and narrow way. He is the door, is he not? He is the path of life. And he tells us, the Lord is my shepherd. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. So Christ came 
for me. He came for you. He came for everybody. You know, I, I think the whole approach of a lot of the modern day church is wrong. We, we, you know, we go into one ditch to another. Have you ever done that? You know, those, there are those in the ditch where they act like it's us against them when Christ is for all of humanity. And then there are those who are in the other ditch says, well, God loves us no matter what we do. Not realizing God, Christ is trying to get you out of that ditch of sin onto the, the, the high and holy way, which leads to life. Leads to success. Leads to joy unspeakable and full of glory. People who are captive by the devil, who are caught up in disobedience to God, who are slaves to their feelings and their emotions, who have turned away from the truth and the fables, they don't have joy. They don't have peace. Don't, they don't have victory. You know, the Bible says, submit yourself to God. Submit yourself to God. Your mind, your feeling, your emotions. Well, I don't know what God's will is. Well, buy yourself a Bible. And especially in the New Testament. Now, I, I don't really suggest people going to the Old Covenant until they understand the New Covenant because without Christ, you can't understand the Old. So I want to understand Jesus. He was the brightness of God's glory, the express image of his person. Christ came to reveal to me the perfect will of the Father, and Christ lived such a life to where he said, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. God made me to know him. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither entered in the heart of man those things which God has prepared for them that love him. I want you to know maybe even if I hang around for another 40 years, that ain't nothing but, a, but, a, but a, uh, just a drop of rain on a hot skillet compared to eternity. I'm just a passing through. I'm a pilgrim and a stranger. See, the devil wants me to get caught up in the here and now when I need to be caught up into eternity. I need to look beyond this life, and I need to anticipate, but I need to be faithful with the little bit that God has given me. I'm telling you, we are coming. We are such a privileged generation. I realize we have more division. We have more chaos. We have more perversion. We have more darkness than probably the, the world has ever known since the days of Noah because they said it would be as the days of Noah. But I want you to know we also have the greatest hope that anybody before has ever, has ever had. I'm telling you, we can capture on a video one moving of the power of the demonstration of God and it can hit the world and see revival everywhere. I'm telling you, we got a powerful message. We got a powerful God. We got a mighty God. He's the almighty Lord, the beginning and the end. And he upholds all things by the word of his power and he's inside of me. Go ahead, say, he's inside of me. Go ahead, take your finger and throw, he's in me. He's in me if you're born again. Well, I don't feel like he's in me. You know, sometimes I don't feel like I'm married, but my wife reminds me pretty quick. It don't matter how I feel. Pastor Michael, what if you ever wake up and you don't feel like a man? I just laugh because I know it's the devil. I mean, I got all the equipment and I've got kids to prove it. I'm a man, praise the Lord. Well, what if you start talking with a feminist voice? I'll bind that devil and tell it to come out of me. Instead of, instead of casting out devils, we've been petting them and, and, and codifying them and telling them everything's okay. It's time that we rise up. So unto us, unto us, say unto us. A child is born unto us, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. What government? He said, behold, all power has been given to me in heaven and earth. That's what he said. The, the, the kingdom of God is already here. It's already within us. Now we're going to see it manifested as we get to the end of, uh, uh, of the tribulation period. We're going to see, and we might even, the trumpet might sound and we'll get out of here. I don't know exactly when, but it's in me right now. He, the king lives in me. The king of glory. Tell the person next to you, the king of glory lives in me. He's the Lord of the Lord and King of Kings. Now he says this though, why do you call me Lord and not do the things I say? He says, who's my mother, my brother, my sister, but they that do the will of my Father which is in heaven. 
Now, I want you to realize we cannot obey God in our own ability. Otherwise, Christ would not have had to come. He had to come to make us new creatures. He had to come to cause us to be born of the word, the incorruptible seed of the word of life. How? By faith. How did Mary get impregnated by the, the, the Holy Ghost by, in, 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 in her womb? How, how, how did the, the seed of life enter into the, her egg and fertilize the egg and she gave birth to the Word? How? By faith. You know what she simply did? She didn't argue with what the angel said. She said, well, how is this going to be? I, I've never known a man. And he told her, which I don't understand. He said, oh, the Holy Ghost is going to overshadow you. Okay. And you know what she said? Let it be done to me according to thy word. That's what you ought to be saying over every part of your life. Oh, God, let it be done to me according to thy word. Not only did Jesus come to free us from sin, but Christ went way beyond that, and he took upon his back his, the stripes that we by his stripes were healed. If I were, I was. If I was, I am. And if I am, I is. I is healed. I don't feel healed. I don't look healed. I don't. You're leaning to the understanding of your natural mind. God says you were. If you were, you was. That's how I've obtained healing for the last 40 years. I'm, if I walk by how I feel, how I look, and what it seems like in the natural, I'm out of that realm of faith, and I'm in trouble. But when I say, God, I believe you, even to the point of death, God, I believe you. I believe your word, let you be true, and every man a liar. I believe you. I believe you. I believe you. And it always seems like God operates at the last second. And then he shows up, praise the Lord. How? Because God, he's, called, he's, he's, he's wanting you to endure by faith. Say by faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So if faith is the only thing that makes God happy, guess what makes the devil happy? Our unbelief. When you doubt God, when you don't agree with God, when you don't believe God, when you, listen, the devil rejoices when you say that which is against the word of God. Now, I'm not talking about going around and being a big mouth and blabbing everything you believe. I'm talking about in your heart. God, I agree with you. I, can, I cannot tell you how many times with my body racked with pain or with circumstances and situations seeming to overwhelm me when it looks like I'm lost like Daniel in the lion's den or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being thrown into the fire when I said, Lord, I believe you. Lord, I believe you. Lord, I believe you. Let God be true, oh God. Walk on the floor of this sanctuary. Nobody's around. Late at night, tears flowing down my face saying, oh God, I believe you. I don't care how I feel. I don't care how it looks. I don't care what the experts say. I don't care what the devil says. I don't even care what my family says. I don't care what the parishioners say. I say what you say, and I say it in the name of Jesus. And I'm telling you, God, every time, every time, say every time. He has showed up. If I did not cast away the hope of my confidence. What if you cast it away, Pastor Mike? Well, I'm still saved. I'm still, I'm still his child. If I cast away and don't trust him. Uh, and I'm not talking about getting involved in the wicked deeds of the flesh. And living in them. I'm talking about daily application of the truth. You understand? This is war, beloved. Peter said, why be surprised at the fiery trial which is about to try you? As though some strange thing has happened, people act shocked. Oh, Pastor Mike, the devil's after me. That's his job. He's, he's supposed to go after you. Why? To prove your love for Christ. To, to manifest your faith. You know, down the road here they, uh, on Flores Church Road, they got, a, they got a forest full of maple trees. And every spring you'll see where they go out and they take a bucket and they take a screw and they screw it into the bark and the meat of that tree and they, hung, they hang that bucket there and the maple syrup begins, the maple begins to come into the bucket and fill it up. And it's wonderful, but if they didn't put the screw to it, the maple syrup would never flow. I'm telling you right now, if the screw ain't applied, the faith won't be manifested. It's got to be manifested. You've got to go through trials. Paul said it, it is absolutely necessary for us to be tested and tried and go through tribulation. 
Without tribulations, the Bible says, no man will enter therein. Why? Because your tribulations and your test becomes your testimony. Give the Lord a hand clap and a shout. Come on, man. None of you have a testimony without a test. But now I look back at some of the, the, the worst tests I've ever gone through. Have you ever gone through a test where you literally thought you were going to lose your mind? I have. Have you ever gone through a test where you thought you were going to lose your physical life? I have. I mean, all of us. But guess what? Now, praise the Lord. You've got the scars. Have you ever seen guys who, who were in the military and they were in battles or even, I don't know, how many of you guys, you know, we break about our wounds. We go, oh, I remember when I got that scar. Look at that scar. See that? I cut right through my artery. Oh, I remember the time when, oh, see that scar? Oh, I remember that. Oh, this scar. Am I? And you talk about your scars because they're a testimony that you came through. I mean, I've had people show me the scars in their belly, and I'm going, I really don't want to see that. Yeah, let me show. I had one person who was trying to show. They said, oh, let me. And they're trying to pull it out. I said, I, gotta, I, said, I don't want to see the scar in the back of you. You know, your blessed assurance. I don't want to see that scar. But see, they had a testimony. You've got scars. I've got scars. We all got scars. But we don't exalt the devil. We go, God got me through this. Today, if you're staying with the same person for 10 years, you've got a testimony. If you stayed with them for 20 years, you got, I tell some people, I've been married for almost 38 years, and they look at me like I've lost my mind, and they said, really? I say, yeah, it's Jesus. Oh, God kept us together. My wife had plenty of good reasons to leave, and she'll tell you the reason she did, because she loved Jesus. Her love for Christ, not her love for me, kept me going. Praise the Lord. Preach myself happy. I didn't even really get into my sermon yet. <laughs> Look what it says here. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name to those who are called by him. His name to them who believe on him. Only those who know him. His name shall be called wonderful. Oh, isn't he wonderful? Come on, isn't Jesus wonderful? The world don't understand, but we are in love with him. He's wonderful. He's marvelous. He's awesome. He's magnificent. He's powerful. He's, he's, uh, he's my all in all. He's my everything. And when Christ, who is my life, shall appear, I will appear with him in glory. I'm in love with him. I can't get enough of him, and he has to have more of me. He's wonderful, and what else is he? He's wonderful. He's counselor. Oh, he's my counselor. If he was not my psychiatrist, I would have lost my mind a long time ago. <laughs> Many times when I look like I'm going to lose it, I go to the Lord. Sometimes, I don't know why, we just kind of hang off and don't pray. And it gets worse, and it gets worse, and then things are getting bad. And finally, out of desperation, and a little something just clicks in our hearts. So I better just go and pray about this thing. I, I, I should have prayed a long time ago. When it first began, see, the minute sickness hits my body, I, I don't wait for it to, into a full-blown manifestation of demonic symptoms. When the first minute that pain hits my little finger with arthritis, I go, you lying devil in the name of it. Well, why don't you pray? Well, I can speak to the mountain because I know by his stripes I was healed. But there's times I held off and held off. And it looked like it was over with. And I finally got before the Lord. And I said, oh, God, I need some wisdom. He says, I've been waiting for you to ask. Because if any man lack, lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Why would James have to say that to the 12 tribes abroad? Because they weren't asking. He said, you have not because you ask not. Lord, I need wisdom. And the first place he's going to take you is to the book. I need wisdom. Have you ever done the complete method and it works? Oh, God, I need wisdom. And you drop your Bible and go, poop. A lot of times it works. And you go, whoa, look, God thought. Now, sometimes, like if you hit the part where it says, and Judas hung himself, get away from there. That ain't God. No, that ain't wisdom. But God will give you wisdom. He's my counselor. Not only is he my counselor, he's the mighty God. We want to look at this in the moment. He is the, Jesus is the mighty God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 
God in flesh. He wasn't just a man. He was God who became flesh. Why? For you. The God, the author, the creator, the maker of all existing things. See, I've never, since I've been born again, not one time in over 40 years, have I ever questioned God's love for me. Not once. But Pastor Mike, what have you been out of the will of God? I, I didn't question his love for me. Listen, like parents, godly parents, no matter what their kids do, they never stop loving them. They want to rescue them. They want to help them. They want to pull them out of the darkness, right? But you still love them. That prodigal son who took his father's wealth and blew it, the father, the father never, he was constantly looking for him and praying for him. He couldn't help him, though, until he wanted help, until he came to his own right mind. But you know what brought that young, that young man to his right mind? He was thinking about the father. Oh, in my father's house, even the servants have it better than me. See, when you get to thinking about the father, it'll drive out the darkness. It'll drive out the fear. It'll drive out the anxiety. It'll drive out the cares of this world. You get to thinking about the father. You get your mind on the father. You get your eyes on God. You get your eyes on, the, on, on he that is the, the author and the creator of all things. And things will change for you. Peter, as long as he kept his eyes on Christ, he could walk on the top of that water in the storm we see of Galilee on that, 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 that windy, nasty night when he jumped up out of the boat. Look what it goes on to say here. The mighty God, the everlasting Father, if you study the Hebrew, it means he's the originator of all existing things. He says, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom in order uh, to order it and to establish it with judgment, with justice from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Let's, before we go back to Matthew chapter 1, let me just unscrabble that. He's talking about David. Now, what was it about David that God loved? He had a heart after God. He said, David is a type and example of Christ. My son, which is coming to the earth. And it says, the Bible, actually the Bible says about Jesus, the zeal of my house has consumed me. When Jesus was 12 years old, he said, I must be about my father's will. You know how Christ was able to bring us to a place of salvation and deliverance? Because in his heart of hearts, he said, I have come to go all the way to the cross, to the grave, and to the resurrection in order to free my people. Look there in Matthew chapter 1. He did it for me. He did it for you. He did it for us. But listen, we got to get a hold of the light of the revelation. He not only did it for you, Nancy, he did it for your children, your grandchildren, your relatives, your neighbors. Listen, he did it for the Muslims. He did it for those involved in perverted lifestyles. He did it for the murderers and the rapists and the killers and the thieves and the liars because such were some of us before. He did it for us. But he gives us the power of choice. But here's the key. How can they be saved if they hear not the gospel? And how can they hear the gospel if there's nobody sent? And how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace. Zacharias, Zacchaeus, he's up in that little, that little tree, man. He's up there looking down. He, he's been told he's lost. He's undone. There's no hope for him. He's a tax collector, little Zacchaeus. And Jesus is walking underneath that tree, and he looks up, and he said, Zacchaeus, come down from there. He knew him by name. He knows you by name. He knows your address. He knows your history. There ain't nothing you've done or ever do or ever shock God. Nothing you've ever done will ever shock God. But he wants to rescue you. He said, come on down. I've got to come to your house today. And that act of kindness and love brought Zacchaeus down. Everybody grumbling and griping that are religious. Who is he think he is to go to that wicked man's house? We understand Jesus said, I come to seek and save them that are lost. I didn't come for the healthy. And there is no healthy outside of Christ, by the way. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. It's the devil that tells you that you can't get right. It's 
the devil that tells you there's no hope, you've gone too far. But you've got to see that you're lost. How can you be found until you're lost? You've got to be found. You know, I remember many times before GPS came along, man, I'd get lost. And my wife would say, honey, pull over and ask somebody. No, I'm not asking nobody. Pull over. I'd get so lost, I finally said, okay. And we'd go somewhere and get direction. You know how stupid we are. Say, God, help me. Deliver me from stupidity, God. But he is our wisdom, isn't he? Look down there what it says in verse 22. Now all this was done. What? The coming of Christ. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord, by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin, virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, with being interpreted is God with us. Now listen, God himself, who created everything in six days, God came for you. I can't comprehend it. It overwhelms me. I mean, this morning as I was in prayer and last night as I'm in prayer laying in bed just praying over what the Lord would spoke to my heart to speak to us today, I was overwhelmed. Have you ever been so overwhelmed by God's love? You just can't hardly contain it. You're just so at a loss for words. Just, God, this filthy no good. Lost. Little nobody. You would have came and died for me. Yes, son, I would have done it for you. I would have done it for every human being that's ever lived. But I won't take away your power of choice. You can open the door, or you can keep it locked. He said, if you keep it locked, he'll break my heart. But if you open that door, I will come into you and sup with you and you with me. See, this is, this is, this is what's so amazing about the gospel. The, the born-again experience is wonderful. And, 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 and your name's written down in heaven. And, and his spirit is in you now. But that is just like a mother getting pregnant. How many know that's just the beginning of the journey? Some of your grandparents even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Some of you whose kids are all over. You say, oh, and you, how many know after your kids grow up, that's not the end? Matter of fact, it just keeps on going if you're a parent of love, right? It just keeps on going and going and going. And you thought, oh, man, when the last kid gets out of the house, I'll be free. You go, what? Really? Oh. Let's, let's close over here. I'm going to take you over here to Romans chapter 8. Let me show you something. We need a revelation. We do need a revelation of God's love. Of the price that he paid, he that is forgiven and much loveth much. The Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, while we were yet living our own life, going our own way, doing our own thing, Christ died for me. You know, the Bible says we love him because he first loved us. I love Christ because he's loved me. Don't ever question God's love for you. What I question is my love for him. I'm supposed to love him. I'm supposed to love him with all of my heart, soul, mind, strength, and being. And until that is completely fulfilled, and most likely in every aspect that won't be into the next life, I just, I won't be complete. I find my completeness in Christ. You know, the Bible says that it, it's like the husband loving the wives. It says, husband, love your wives. like, Come on, man, this is a tall order. We'd like to get stuck on the previous verses. Wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands. No, husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. I, I remember, and there's been times when my family was going through terrible ordeals. It could be sickness. It could be disease. It could be other problems. But I remember that time when Danny got Rabies, and I've shared it many times because I think it's, an, uh, it's, it's God's mercy. And Danny got rabies. And he told me he, he was beyond help. My heart broke. My heart broke. Now, I could have heart in my heart and said, oh, well. And he's laying in bed, and he told me he was, uh, I think he was 16 years old. 
He told me, he said, Dad, I'm not right with God. I'm going to hell. I said, well, get right with God, Danny. Get right. He said, I can't, Dad. The devil told him he couldn't. And he said, Dad, if I did, I wouldn't be sincere. My heart broke. Have you ever had your heart break? Just so broken. You thought you were going to die. And my wife and my uh, Stephen and Stephanie, uh, and we got around, and Michael got around, Danny laying in bed, running a high fever. We're all crying. We're all weeping. The snot is flowing. We're just wailing. Oh, God. Oh, God. Okay. And we could have got up and walked away. But love wouldn't let me walk away. Love, the love of Christ in my heart for my son Daniel. I said, love in my heart for my son Daniel that God put there. God put there. I had to go down into the front room. And I'm thinking, okay, I need direction, God. I need mercy. I need help. My son is dying up there from rabies and, and the whole congregation that got in contact with that wild raccoon. They're, they're telling me they're all going to have to get shots. And even a pregnant woman, probably seven months pregnant. And I wasn't worried about the end of the church. But I said, Lord, you, what am I going to do? And the only thing I could think of is in the old covenant that they would cover themselves with, with sackcloth and ashes. Well, I didn't have sackcloth. You know, I didn't have a, uh, any uh, potato bags. But I thought, okay, I, I've got ashes in my wood stove. I, I said, God, I, all I could think about is, God, I need you. If I ever needed you, if I ever needed you, it wasn't me looking upon my faith or how good I was or how righteous I was. I said, God, I need you. I need you more than I, le- I, I need my life. I, I'd rather die than to let my son Daniel die. Lord, I I need you. And so I pulled the ashes out of the wood stove and dumped them over my body. And I'm breathing it into my lungs. It's in my eyes. And I'm covered with wood ash. And I fell on my face, weeping and crying. And all I could do was say, God have mercy. God have mercy. Oh, for an hour. God have mercy, oh God, take the, take the virus of the rabies out of Danny. Take the virus of the rabies out of the congregation. And Lord, even take the virus of the rabies out of the raccoon. Because even if you heal us all, if they discover rabies in that raccoon, everybody's going to get shots. And I prayed, and I wept, and I prayed, mercy. All I could do was say mercy. I couldn't even quote scriptures. Mercy for my son. I believe this is why we don't see a lot of people healed the way we should. Because we don't get desperate. We don't get desperate for God. So I got desperate. Four hours. I am not exaggerating. Five hours. Six hours. Seven hours. Lost my voice. Lungs congested. Eyes stuffy and red from the wood ash. Sixteen hours. How long would you have done it? I would have done it for days if I had to. God have mercy. And about 6 o'clock in the morning, I'm telling you, the glory of the Lord came upon me. Peace hit my heart. Faith rose up. And I jumped up and I said, it's done. Praise the Lord. Tell me we would not have revival. Tell me if we would not have a move of God in our homes if that love of Christ would rise up in us. Look what the scripture says here. This is amazing. This is amazing in Romans chapter 8. Look in verse verse 32. He that spared not his own son. Verse 32, Romans chapter 8. But delivered him up for who? For us all. For all of humanity. How shall he not with them also freely give us all things? The previous verse says, if God be for us, who can be against us? I'm telling you, the God of all love and all compassion, of all mercy, he's reaching out to us now. He's reaching out to all of humanity. John and James, when they were turned out of the town of Samaria, because they wouldn't let them stay there in the room, they said, Lord, let us call fire down from heaven. And Jesus said, you don't know what spirit you're all of. He said, I don't want to kill the Samaritans. 
I want to save them. You know, here's, you know what the root, you know, you know when, when we talk about hate, and, and the Bible, and I'm going to say this very carefully because people misunderstood this years ago when I preached it. If you go into the Old Covenant, now this, listen very carefully as we close here. In the Old Covenant, you will find where it says God hates the wicked. Let me tell you, it's like love. Man's love and God's love, they're not the, sa they're, they're not the same animal. They're not the same thing. When God says he hates the wicked, what he is saying, oh, I want to rescue you. Oh, I want to save you. Oh, I want to deliver you. It's, it's a holy unction to free us. And actually, that's why Jesus came. God says, I've got to rescue them if it means I've got to become flesh and blood and take their sins and die and go to hell. I will do it. I will do it. And he has done it. Give the Lord a hand clap and a shout. He loves us people. It's such a mind-boggling love. It's such a powerful love. And, and you know what? For you to live in that realm, how, how many have ever the spirit of travail came on you? How many know what the spirit of travail is? Oh, you had to weep, you had to pray, you had to stand in a gap. And it felt like you were dying. You know why? Because you're becoming a partaker of the sufferings of Christ, of the sufferings of the Father and the Holy Spirit. In the old days, people would be at the altar for days weeping and wailing for sinners. Their hearts were broken for those who were going to spend eternity in hell. I'm telling you, it's coming back. God's not done yet. God's not done yet. Father, we thank you that the word of the Lord would not return void. Now, thank you, Lord. We have great hope today. You came for us. You came for, for humanity. Lord, you're not going to let the devil have us. Lord, I thank you that you're going to snatch us out of the flames of hell. Not just, when I say us, I'm not talking about just the believers, even though we're a part of it. I'm talking about the multitudes and the multitudes and the multitudes are going to come in. Lord, we thank you for them in advance. Say, yes, Lord, let it be in Jesus' name. I'm telling you, God wants to help you. Let him help you. Let him help you. Let him make you the kind of person he wants to, you to be. He really wants to help you. Let me just, I want to really encourage you. Some of you live in some real rough areas. You see a lot of things. When you, when you, look, on, when you look on the people in the world who are all messed up, goofed up, they don't know what's right and what's wrong, don't look upon them with a self-righteous, condemning attitude. Look at them and realize that could be you and that was you at one time. And that you want to see God rescue them. You know, that's why we share Christ. We don't share Christ because, well, I'm commanded to. No, love motivates us. You know, I can honestly tell you all these years of being a pastor, what, the number one thing that has motivated me is my love for God and for people to tell the truth even. How many ever knew if you told the truth in love, people were going to hate you for it? Jesus said they would. But we've got to speak the truth in love. We've got to speak it in love, not in self-righteousness. I want to see people rescued. We're going to see it. Can you shout amen? amen. Well, let's stand to our feet and give the Lord a hand clap and a shout. Lord, we just lift your hand.